when we come to this table, we don't come trusting in our own righteousness. We come trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have been robed with his righteousness. We've been covered. All of our failings, all of our shortcomings, all of our sins, all of our errors, all of our wrong thoughts and misdeeds and doings, they're covered by the blood of Christ. So this morning, Father, we come to you not trusting in our own righteousness, but in your great and manifold grace, mercy, and love. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we have failed. That you would forgive us when we fail to be an obedient people. And as we come to this table, we want to come with clean hands and clean heart. So cleanse us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a right and good and joyful thing to praise God everywhere at all times. The baptism of our Lord, the Spirit descended on him and declared him to be the beloved Son of God. The Spirit came upon him and he was able to turn away the temptations of sin. God's Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come that he would save his people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. Wow. Anybody eat with sinners this week? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some amen. It can be a little tedious to sit and eat with sinners. They may not know Jesus like you know Jesus. One of these days the church will wake up and understand we cannot expect lost people to act good on their own. They may try real hard, but it's hard for a lost person to behave like a Christian. Yes. So we need to cut them some slack and give them some grace and pray for them. Yes. Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So this morning, we gather around the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ who gave birth to our church. He delivered us from slavery to sin and death. He made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord ascended, He promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire as on the day of Pentecost. Lord, let your fire fall to me. Yeah. Hallelujah. And on the night in which He gave Himself up for us, He took the bread gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take this and eat. This is my body which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. On these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Well, those who are assisting this morning, uh, come and receive this tray. And, um, Carol, do we know who, who we have this? There they are. And, um, they will hand to you their hands and their sanitize. 
pasteurized, homogenized, and glorified and sanctified. So we can say that. And uh, we're going to have one center line to come up, take the elements, take the little cup. It has the little bread in it and the juice. And then when you get back to your seat, Open those cups up together. We'll eat the bread together. And then have you eat the bread, we'll drink the cup together. So this morning we do this together as the body of Christ. So you're welcome to come. One line down the center aisle. You come as the Spirit leads you. We're just going to wait on the Lord this morning to bless us with His presence.
receive now the body of Christ, broken for you.
Yeah. 
What warfare? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And just not even show up. It's a good way to lose the war if you don't show up. And then the second challenge is to show up for the battle and not know the enemy. So the devil does not like what we're talking about today or last week or the days ahead. Because we're going to expose yes. the workings of the enemy. We're going to read his playbook. Just like a, a couple of teams that got caught reading each other's hand signals and signs during the sporting event. We're going to know what the devil is up to before we do battle, because if we don't know our enemy, we uh, certainly will struggle. So this sermon series is entitled, Wake Up to the Supernatural. Wake Up to the Supernatural. On September 17th, 1859, a most unusual decree appeared in the San Francisco Bulletin newspaper. In grandiloquent fashion, the message stated, At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens, I, Joshua Norton, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States. It went on to command representatives from all the states to convene in the Bay Area to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is laboring. The edict was signed, Norton I, Emperor of the United States. The newspaper editors had printed the imperial decree on a lark. But over the next 20 years, its author would grow into one of San Francisco's most recognizable tourist attractions. Clad in a Epaulette adorned navy coat, an ostrich feather plume hat, and occasionally carrying a military saber, the delightfully eccentric Emperor Norton I walked the streets, accepting mock fealty from all who were willing to indulge his royal fantasy. He ate in restaurants for free, issued his own currency, and made official proclamations that ranged from the comical to the surprisingly prophetic. It didn't matter that the self-styled ruler was more than a little unhinged, or that he actually was a poor beggar whose palace was a local flop house. Many in San Francisco enjoyed playing along with the joke. It is even reported that when Emperor Pedro II of Brazil visited the city by the bay, its residents marched out their beloved mad monarch for a formal meeting. Emperor Norton I, Emperor of the United States, by his own decree. What a odd historical tidbit. It's just amazing. I, I guess in today's world, you could almost uh, see that happening again in all of the chaos that surrounds us. But this is precisely what Satan did many eons of millennia before. In Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, Lucifer, the son of the morning, 
decides to make a decree, a royal decree. And when he speaks that decree, he lists five I wills. This is what I'm going to do as Emperor Lucifer. So let me read for us verses 12 through 14 of Isaiah 14. It should be there in your bulletin and part of your notes. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lucifer on that day proclaimed an all-out assault on the kingdom of heaven against the king of heaven. It was an assault that basically, according to Ezekiel 28 last week that we read, the Bible says that when God created this angelic being, this cherub, this anointed cherub, the one we understand to be Lucifer, Satan, the devil, he created him perfect, and he created it powerful. And verse 15 of Ezekiel 28 says that you were perfect until iniquity was found in you. Here we get a closer glimpse. Last week we saw the start of sin and evil, but now we're going to the source of sin and evil. What happened in that moment when he sinned? I want you to notice that the Bible says in verse 13, For you have said in your heart. You see, these decrees weren't necessarily something that Satan did and stood up in front of all of heaven and made these declarations. I am Emperor Lucifer. No, he said them in his heart. Friends, I'm going to tell you that sin always starts on the inside. You and I, when we struggle with sin and fight sin, it starts here in our heart. It starts ruminating in our minds. It starts gestating. And according to James, it says when sin uh, has given birth, it gives birth to death. Jesus said it's what comes out of a man that defiles it. Do not be deceived, friends. Anytime you and I venture into sin, we didn't just accidentally go, whoops. Yep. Yep. Now some of those whoops, oops moments, not don't, don't get whoops in there. Oh man, I'll get in trouble with the Aggies. Some of those oops moments are just habitual. You know, we uh, struggle with our tempers, so something happens and boom, we just get lit up like a Roman candle. Because it's habitual. We're just so used to it. We have an acerbic tongue. Somebody says something we don't particularly care uh, about, and we just slice them and dice them in little pieces with our tongue. You ever known anybody like that? Boy, that, it's hard to share a meal with somebody like that. But many times the sins that we commit, they've been 
ruminating on the inside. And when Satan sinned, this source was in his heart. He said five I wills. But I want you to notice also that up until that time there was one will in heaven. One will in heaven. There was harmony. Everything was beautiful. But as soon as Satan exercised his will, then there was disharmony. There were two wills now instead of one. Now I'm not going to get too personal this morning. But I will say that the first year of my marriage with Carol. Carol and I are both a couple of strong-willed individuals. She's a good German stock. Powerful, strong, womanly, courageous, ferocious. Get out of the way. Because she's able to, to come into a room and Make sure everything is the way it needs to be. Now, I'm grateful for that. Because I come into a room and I'm just grateful to be in the room. <laughs> and then, poor Mario, growing up in a Hispanic culture, where the papa was the macho man. They even made a song about that. Didn't they? Macho, macho man. I want to be a macho man. The older I get, it's becoming more of a nacho, nacho man. You put a strong, bull-headed Mexican macho man with a strong, womanly German woman. And for the first year of our marriage, Jennifer and Ray, it was the battle of the wills. I've learned after 42 years to say, yes, dear. Yes, my precious. The other day she was working hard and she was hungry. She said, honey, I'm hungry. I said, baby, I'll take you anywhere you want to go for lunch. Anywhere. You just name the place. And she said, Red Lobster. And I went, I hate Red Lobster. I don't want to go to Red Lobster. But if you want to go to Red Lobster, I'll take you to Red Lobster. And then, thank God, somebody told me Red Lobster shut down. The Lord was with me. <laughs> you see, when you have two wills battling it out, there's disharmony. Am I preaching to any married couples this morning? And you know, we we fought pretty good. It was like Saturday night wrestling at our house for a long time. Until it occurred, really, it occurred to both of us almost at the precise exact moment when it, the little light just came on and said, wait a minute, it's not your will versus my will, but it's our wills under the will of God. You see, when, when I submit my will to the will of God, and she submits her will to the will of God. There's harmony. Because there's only one will. It's the will of God. So if there's disharmony in your relationships this morning, just take it to the Lordship of Christ. And say, Lord, help me. I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn and I need your help. Well, Satan gave five I wills. Let's look at the first one. The first one, he says, I will ascend into heaven. 
Now, this is an unfortunate translation only in this sense. I love the, King, the New King James. But the Hebrew says, I will ascend into the heavens. You remember in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are three heavens. Do you know that right now this, this air that we don't see, this space, this is a heaven. It's the first heaven. It's the space where we breathe and move and every creature of God that is a human being is anchored in two worlds. An earthly anchor and an unseen, invisible world. That's why we that's why breath is so important. You know, just like that song says, just breathe. Just breathe. So he, Satan, right off the bat, what he does, it would be like if you sat down, and I'm not a card-playing person. So I don't know, I've seen enough movies and TV shows to see people playing cards. But it'd be like if on the first hand, of the beginning of the first game that somebody says, I am all in. And I mean, they put all their chips and everybody has to pony up all their chips. And in that one fell swoop, all of the chips are on the table. Satan went for the whole thing all at once. He said, I'm going to ascend into the heavens I'm going after the possessions of God. Because if I get all three of the heavens, I got the whole thing. He was going after the property of God. The possessions of God. And let me tell you something, Saint. The greatest possessions that God has today are you and me. And I got news for you, Satan is still after the possessions of God. And Satan's attitude is, listen, if I can't have them, then I, nobody's going to have them, I'll just kill them. And so he comes to kill and steal and destroy the devil is still trying to exercise his will. We are his possessions according to the Ephesians 1.14. Well, would you know, second of all, there was a second, I will. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, the stars represent the angels, all the angelic realm. And here, Satan is trying to achieve primacy over God's angels. Superiority. You know, there are angels, there are archangels, seraph, uh, seraphim, cherubim. It's a little similar to uh, the ranks that you see in the military. You know, you don't enlist in the military and start out as a general. You just start out as a, you know, a private. Just a private. I mean, you're not even a private first class. You've got to move up to that. Well, there are ranks in heaven. There are ranks in the angelic realm. And Satan said, I want to have superiority and promise, uh, primacy over all of God's angels. But third of all, he said, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farther side of the north. When a powerful person sits. What, what happens when you go into a courtroom and the, and the, and the guy says, All rise. The Honorable Judge so-and-so presiding. We all rise and when the judge sits down, he's there to exercise his authority. 
in that court of law. Well, this is what Satan wanted to do. He wanted to have absolute authority, and so he wanted to acquire the power of God. So now he's going after the possessions, he's going after privacy, he's going after the power of God. Listen, I, I know many of us don't like to hear this. But all of us probably have some kind of a boss. And those of us who uh, decided many, many years ago and said, well, I'm not going to have a boss. I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to be my own boss. I'm going to start my own company. I'm the man. I'm the boss. Well, guess what? You still got a boss. Because when you go down this road and you go 20 miles too fast and you get pulled over, you got a boss. Boss Hall. <laughs> I tell you, I, I've been pulled over so many times. Especially when I had long hair. Joseph, I had long hair down to the middle of my back. There's a big, gigantic, rolling curl when I had hair. And I drove a red Cadillac that was low to the ground. And I'd come tooling through Humble, Texas, and every cop would say, there goes a bad dude. I'm pulling him over. He's probably running drugs. And I'd get pulled over. One time I got pulled over in front of the parsonage. <laughs> And I just sat there. I'm smart enough to not back talk or mouth with the authorities. And I said, yes, sir, officer, how, how may I help you? He said, let me say something. ID. He looked at me and he looked at my ID. He saw the address from the house. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I live here. He said, well, this is a church. I said, yes, sir, that's a church parsonage. What are you doing at the church? I said, I'm the youth director. <laughs> he called it in and came back and said, all right, thank you very much. And I got pulled over so many times that it was finally reported to the administrative assistant, uh, the police chief, who was a member of our church. <laughs> she went to the chief and she said, chief, our youth director keeps getting pulled over. Because he's a long-haired Hispanic man driving a red Cadillac. And everybody thinks he's running drugs. And the police chief exercised his authority and said, leave that man alone. Leave him alone. Listen, friends, we all have authority figures in our life. I serve this church. Regina serves this church at the good pleasure of the bishop of the Texas Annual Conference. And if we want to get ourselves in trouble, we just need to start rebelling against that authority structure. Well, there's a fourth thing he said, the fourth I will. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. The clouds in Scripture represent the glory of God. The Bible says that he was taken up in a cloud, and he's going to come back on a cloud. There's a great cloud of witnesses. There, there was a cloud that covered the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. It's the glory, the manifest glory of God. That cloud imagery is representing the majesty of God. And here Satan wants to achieve prestige, the prestige of God. I want to be like that, where I'm majestic and I'm glorified. Uh, you know, full of glory and majesty. It kind of reminds me, did, did any of y'all ever see the royal weddings of the British monarchy when, you know, all the all these people get married? 
you know, you go into this humongous cathedral and, and there's choirs and trumpets and organs and, and robes and scepters and crowns and it's just the most majestic thing you've ever seen. That's what Satan wants in the heavenlies. He wants majesty and glory to be cast upon him. Then finally, he says, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to achieve parity with God. P-A-R-I-T-Y. Parity with God. Equality with God. I'm going to be just like God. When I was growing up, there used to be a TV show called Queen for a Day. Those of you uh, my age and a couple of years older probably remember Queen for a Day. But what it was, it was uh, sponsored by all of these different manufacturers for an advertising 30-minute uh, show where they could advertise all of their goods. And what they would do is they would somehow get a, a name of a lady that had been submitted and, and what they did is they brought her onto the show and they put a robe on her and they made her sit on the throne and they gave her a little crown and a scepter and she was queen for a day. And they would lavish her with all of these gifts. Oh, you get a year's supply of tithe. You get a year's supply of weed. You get a year's supply of dialed soap. You get a year's supply of Colgate toothpaste. And everything was just, it was just one gigantic 30 minute infomercial. But she was queen for a day. Anybody ever be tempted to want to be God for a day? I have, and I think to myself, you know, if I were God for a day, there'd be some things I'd fix up real quick. I mean, I'd settle some scores pretty fast. I'd fix some things in the government real good. I'd fix some things at home with the kids real fine. Just let me be God for a day. It's ludicrous. It's as ludicrous as Emperor Norton the First. And yet, listen to me, if you don't hear anything else this morning, that is precisely what you and I face every single day. We are tempted and we think, oh, I don't need to do what God wants me to do. I'll just do my thing. I'll exercise my will. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. Genesis 3, 4 and 5. Satan is tempting Eve and he says, In the day that you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you shall be like God. In Acts 12, King Herod had stood up to make a proclamation. Actually, he sat down to make a proclamation in the seat of authority. And he proclaimed this decree. And the Bible says that the people began to shout, This is not the voice of a man. This is the voice of a God. And the Bible says that King Herod was stricken in that very moment. And he keeled over dead. And his bowels burst open. And he was filled with worms. And the worms ate him. <laughs> Friends, if you don't think that God takes seriously us wanting to enthrone ourselves as God in our lives, you got to understand it's a serious thing. 
And when there's one will in your life, there's harmony. I, I, I tell you, I, I don't want my horrible pride to rear up and say to me, you know better than God. You know, you know better. You know what to do. No bother God. He's busy. And I'll just handle it. No, I always want to be humble before the Lord. What do you want me to do, Father? How do you want me to do it? When? Wait on the Lord. So this morning, we're going to do another corporate renunciation. And I'm going to ask, like we did last Sunday, I'm going to ask everybody in this church house to stand to their feet. Everybody standing to their feet. And I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I'm going to ask you repeat after me the simple prayer. I promise you it will not be anything that will be odd or bizarre or weird. It will be a prayer that I pray my heart and your heart that will do it honestly, that will say it out loud and not be afraid to say it out loud. But if you would, repeat after me. Dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today I renounce my sin of willful rebellion. I ask that you forgive me for placing my will above your will. I surrender my will to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, if you meant that, God will honor that prayer. I, I hate sin. I hate evil. It hurts my heart. It messes my life up. It messes with me and with you and with this church and with this community and with this state and with this nation and with this world. I hate it. And I want us to have the victory over it. We start by renouncing it and saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. We surrender the Lordship of Christ. All right, if you would be seated. This morning... Uh, we have the joy to receive Ray Thompson. He's coming, and uh, Ray and Jennifer got married. They had an absolutely go ahead and come on up here. They had an absolutely uh, Regina, meet him here. Just uh, make sure you wear your mask and meet him there on the floor. And we're gonna, uh, as Regina says, we're gonna read him in. But it was my joy to do their wedding counseling before they got married. And I want you to know, they're both real, true Christians. Yes. They know the Lord. And they, they have uh, found each other at this stage in their life. And I'm telling you, they are a blessing one to the other. And they're a blessing to our church. And so, uh, having gotten married then, Ray said, I think I'm brave enough to join that, uh, that band of saints down there called Alder's Gate. And so, Ray, it's my joy to, to uh, ask you just a couple of things. Uh, Ray, is Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord? You would say he is. And do you want to come today and join this fellowship? Will you support this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if you would say, I will. Wonderful. Well, church, we're happy to receive Ray Thompson this morning. Give him a hand. And, uh, Jennifer, do you want to say anything about your new husband? Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can go back and be seated.
season. Well, I know if it was a, if it wasn't mid-COVID, we put them right here in the middle. We all line up. We all hug them and, and, and love on them and welcome them. But we can't do that, so we just have to kind of do a, a virtual hug and a virtual kiss and say welcome. Maybe somebody else says, you know, I, I might want to join that bunch too. But you're welcome to come and do that now if you'd like. We'd like to talk to you about that. Uh, uh, Pastor Regina had visited with Ray previous, and so we'd like to visit with you. We want to make sure that you understand what you're getting in for. <laughs> uh, we, we're a church that wants to honor the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, that concludes our service this morning. It's a little bit different uh, ending this morning. Um, I, I want to just warn you. And uh, I tell you what, if Bobby, if you want to go ahead and uh, cut our live feed, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I necessarily want Facebook world to, to hear this next part. Are we clear?